computer. Okay, welcome everybody to the uh, May edition of the Tips and Tricks SIG. Uh, our typical format will be our um, just an open forum, and then we'll go into our topics, which I'd sent out topics and uh, for tips and tricks to proceed. Uh, who'd like to open up the floor with the first question of the evening? Uh, okay, nobody's got problems. Nobody's got issues. I like that. To circle um, back from last month. Ah, we're circling back from last month. Okay. Okay, I was given a task. I was not able to complete it as of yet. I did do the research, and that was to be able to scan using my... Uh, your phone? iPhone. And it seems like I, what I was going to do is I was going to put a turntable with the object on and put the camera solid. That was my initial thought. That will not work. Okay, what, what was your task? The task was to scan an item for 3D printing. For 3D printing, okay. All right. And your iPhone has the ability to scan in 3D, doesn't it? Yes, it and does. Yeah. So what? when I downloaded the app, I found out that the object has got to be stationary. You have to move the phone around the object. Ah, not the object, not the phone stationary and twirling the object. It's got to be the other way around. Yes, because it must use its uh, inertial navigation to actually do the the points around it. Got it. So I've got to work on something because I'm not steady enough to hold that phone out two foot from a, an object the size of an end scale railroad car. Okay. All right. So I'm going to continue to work on it and hopefully I'll have it by next month. We'll be looking forward to it. Hey, Pete, how about since you've got the turntable? I know you couldn't put the phone on the turntable, but you could have something that is like the outside of it. Like uh, at Riverview, they used to have that thing you cling to the sides of and the floor <laughs> would drop out. I think <laughs> set up something similar to that, but attach the phone to it. Don't use don't use centrifugal force. <laughs> <laughs> and please don't let the floor drop out. OK, well, actually, you would need the floor out in order to have the object in the center on the on the turntable. Uh, and you just simply have paper plate with the hole in the middle where you put the phone. I, I think my engineering skills are great enough to figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you, yeah, you could have like a, a cylinder around it, around I'm the thinking, turntable. I'm thinking of a pedestal in the middle to hold the object. Yep. And a, a, a ring on bearings around the pedestal, attached right. to the pedestal, so it's indexed. And an arm from the ring with a, a servo controlling so the arm rotates at a constant velocity. Yeah. yeah. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I was thinking uh, before you ever said anything. I don't think yeah. you need a necessarily be down to a servo level. Um, just keeping it steady on that armature, yeah. if you circle around, yeah. would be enough for it because that's part of their system is they're set up for the inaccuracy of the human doing the scanning. But I don't know. Hey, we'll see what you come up with, Pete. Yeah. I like that. OK, so next question. What was the first one? Next question. Next topic. Next topic. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have the calendar, the Outlook calendar. Yes. And at the beginning, I had the the reminders in the corner every morning, but now I I can't get the reminders. And this is Windows 11. Hmm. When did that go away? That's what I don't know. And I went back on and looked and saw where it said reminders, and I turned it on. It was off and I turned it on. That still didn't help. <clears throat> that sounds like uh, an old uh, Microsoft habit of uh, resetting uh, uh, settings and that. Uh, most of it, they uh, finally stopped doing that uh, uh, because of complaints. Apparently, that one is uh, escaped it. 
Is there a oh, separate okay. separate list of reminders that you have that you work with that you can edit? That well, I don't have. I don't get access? any. At the beginning, I got reminders that you know every morning in the left uh, right corner. How did you computer. put them in there? I put them on the calendar. Directly I mean, on the calendar itself. Up. I didn't hear you. Directly on the calendar itself. Yes. Yeah, you can do this with any of the other calendars. You just add them uh, like appointments, as an example, or Zoom meetings, et cetera, et cetera. So I put so I put so many in now <laughs> that I want to stay with the uh, with Outlook because I, you know, I put a lot in now. I just want the reminders to show show up. Uh, one possibility, and this is uh, just an off chance. Uh, check the window setting for notifications. If that's off, it may not pop up that uh, uh, notification. I usually uh, uh, use a, a different calendar and I send myself an email reminder that uh, uh, shows up in my emails. Well, it was beautiful at the beginning, but I'll, we'll, I'll keep working with it. You coming in? Oh. I didn't get any help with that. So these are Outlook calendar notifications, and you want to see them when Outlook is not open? I want to see them like in the morning when you when you first turn on the computer and the and the reminder of the important things for that day are down there in the right lower left part of the That's lower right windows. Yeah, the lower right corner of Windows. Yeah. So these are Windows notifications, but right. they originate with your Outlook calendar. Right. Okay. Yeah, you need to adjust your notification settings. Yeah, that's uh, in a uh, uh, start button uh, settings and under systems is notifications. Okay. I'll try that. All right. And there's a whole bunch of things you can control about notifications, even in Windows 11, which has changed things a bit. Usually I uh, turn them off myself, Matt, because most of the notifications I get are garbage to start with. Uh, well, you, you have to. What? Oh, go, go, go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm coming up with another question. I'm going to try what you said. Widgets. Never oh. played them. Widgets. Popping up, popping up without you asking for them. Mm -hmm. um, well, 11. I didn't, I've got I didn't. 11, but I, uh, 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 I turn my widgets off because I don't want them. Well, I thought I turned them off too. That's in settings also uh, for Windows itself. So okay, you guys have the start settings. And I can't remember where the widgets were at. You, you might have to do use the search box and type in widgets. Because I don't remember exactly what category uh, widgets was under. And there are some a couple of special widgets, which have their own controls, like the news and uh, news and information, or whatever it is, your news feed, news and weather. Yeah, news and weather. Uh, that one I've published a couple times. That how to uh, disable that if you don't like it. I mean, yeah, it's nice to be able to get news and weather, but it's not nice to have it foisted on you all the time when you're trying to work. <laughs> but Microsoft doesn't see a difference. <laughs> Thank you. Why, why do I keep hearing a doorbell? Uh, that's where, that's when people, people want to get into your house. <laughs> that's when people are being admitted or first pop into uh, Zoom. Okay. And then I, okay. When they pop up to, to be admitted, they get a ding. And then when you admit them, you get another ding. So. Okay. Is that, is that called a ding dong? Yeah, it's the ding dong thing. Ding dong, ding dong, dong. <laughs> yeah, so Pete, all they're trying to do is come over to your place and have a party. 
Yeah. <laughs> as long as they pay for their airfare and their hotel, I'm okay. <laughs> Zoom pays for that. <laughs> okay. Anyway, next, I next question, new direction. Yeah. Uh, yes, Dennis. Um, I've got I've got a uh, I have Wow cable and internet. Um, and from Wow, I've had a modem that was years old, and then connected to that, I had my own router. You know, uh, broadcasting both on the two point four and the five one bands. So WOW has been bought and taken over by another company and they sent us new routers. New cable new, modem? Ca uh, cable modem. Cable, cable modem, modem, sorry. And this thing is above and beyond the old thing that's been sitting there for years and years and years. This new one, it, it has not just, not just the... Um, it has the four plugs on the back to connect, you know, wired internet. That's because it's a modem router. It has Not a couple have a, has a couple phone connections. That's right. But, it's a modem router that handles Boppy uh, phone service if you want to use it. But right. it's not a strict modem. Yeah. You can it's, still but, use your internal router. You just run a cable from uh, the back of that new one into your uh, uh, old router, and everything stays well, working. Well, I did do that, but the thing about this new cable modem is, <sighs> it's also it's called an Aris Aris brand. That's right. I got it's, one. It's it's automatically broadcasting on the two point four and five point one that's correct Five. internet yes so, so when i go when my wife was looking at her like um her iphone right she's seeing this heiress that's right as well as our own router that is correct and both are legitimate so so my question is as long as we don't connect to the heiress am i going to is there any problem? You know, I've always heard problems in the past of, you know, that if you have too many um, no, signals. Uh, there's an outside this problem with this over. router, even there though we're not connecting to it. With your Wi Fi going on both, yes, mostly on the 2.4, you can collide. Whereas on the 5, there's a, a reasonable chance you won't collide, but it can happen. Yes. But Even if I'm not connected to it. So that's right. right. That's right. It has nothing to do with your connection. Well, Dennis, I, that is the same setup as Comcast or Xfinity or XFi. Yeah. And I, I have not run into interference issues. These ARIS, mod, I, these ARIS modems are really good at, uh, the router side of it is really good at selecting automatically the most open channel they can find. And your device is probably pretty good at finding a good open channel as well. And if you got the iPhone, you can use an analyzer and find out what's the least used. There might even be a channel that's unused. Dennis, I how old is your, is your original router that you were using? Uh, my router. Um, it's, a Lynx. it's a Cisco Linksys. I'm going to say five years. Five years? Yeah. Okay. Um, That's about end of life. Yeah, meaning you still could. There's, there's no reason you can't use it, but in, I don't know why you would want to run two routers in your house for, for accessing the internet. I would just disconnect your old one and use the new Eris one. And configure how, how safe is the air and they sent us on the bottom of the router a security key 
You can like change that. You can change that. Okay, wait. I mean, so, how, but even if I change it, how safe is it? The, the earth, pretty safe. Yeah, it's going to be. I've been safe. using it for uh, 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 over a year. I uh, there are some privacy issues because yes, your ISP can do all kinds of spying on you, and right. uh, they could do that even if you use your own router. That's right. But but uh, you have less control over. Uh, security settings and ports, port forwarding, and all kinds of complicated things that most people don't do. But if you're a gamer, you might do port forwarding. The problem with Comcast and their Aris routers is you can no longer do that through the website. And you can no longer do that through 10.0.0.0 in your browser. You well, have to do it using a phone app. Well, with and that's uh, a pain in the but for port forwarding. With Comcast, uh, uh, it used to be very difficult to make changes. With WoW, now Astound, uh, 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 it's, uh, uh, you can go in and do your own settings. You can uh, uh, put a password on the uh, 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 administrator's account. You can change the names of each of the frequencies to anything you want. You can change the passphrase for each of the frequencies on Wi-Fi. Bunch of things. I've been doing it for well over a year. And most of these changes can be can still be made through the interface they provide at their website. Well, I can do it uh, uh, right through my web browser. Yes, that. So with wait, Comcast, wait, wait. With Dennis, Comcast, I got limited. Dennis was asking, "Is this a safe?" device to use it's as safe as almost all of them out there on the market period. okay so it's it's really a safe device should you decide to still use your own router router and still keep the Aris running you can go in and turn off the router portion of that device of the Aris you could turn off the radios in there, but you're gonna to have to go in through the browser to IP address into it and make the configurations. In my opinion, you don't want two of them running in the same household close to proximity. You're just what gonna- you Yeah, what you can do is put the Aris into bridge mode. Right. And then it goes, then it uses your router. Oh. But I you, might, you might consider a router upgrade. Yeah. It would be in a router upgrade, it, you know, by just using theirs, it's an upgrade. Yeah. I don't know what you, your needs are that are potentially different for your situation, as Tim was touched on. Um, that is, are you doing it, or de I'm sorry, Bob was touching about port forwarding, if you're doing yeah. anything like that. You, no. You'll still be able to do it in that new device. But if you're not doing anything funky, just go ahead and configure it yourself with your own names and uh, use that device and disconnect your old one, but leave your old one as a standby in a closet someplace. And yeah. here's the other thing. All routers have to have firmware updates. On average, the majority of companies only do it for five years. After that, there's no more security updates to keep you safer. Uh, uh, so, if yours doesn't have any more updates coming to it, the old one, then every day that goes by, you uh, have an increased risk using it. Uh, on the other side of the coin, since Eris is owned uh, uh, by uh, uh, the ISP, they'll keep it up to date on the firmware. You don't have to, but your manual, the one you own, that's your responsibility. Just like yep. uh, Microsoft Windows, just like your Chromebook. Those are your responsibility to update them. But, uh, but, uh, my, but my personal router, it won't work without plugging it into their cable. That is correct. As right. long as their cable modem is they're providing the protection for that, that protection automatically goes up to my router then. No, it acts as a modem. And yeah. as a modem, 
you can either use their built-in security settings or I uh, probably astound will offer you a free package of extra security. And that would protect any IoT devices you might have. It would protect any alarm system you might uh, eventually get. It would protect, uh, it would give you additional protections and they might even throw in some antivirus. Um, explain that a bit more. I think I've been lost, Bob. So the Aris modem is a secure device that has protections. It has some protections. If I plug my router into it, then I lose some of the protections then that it provides? I uh, No. If anything, your own router would actually add its own protections, which might be additional, might interfere. I okay. probably would make no net difference. That, that is unless the, the attack comes in wirelessly through your router and not through the internet itself. Okay, okay. And though those are not terribly common attacks, although people have attacked devices like ring doorbells directly over the air. Okay. Okay. Uh, just be aware of the risks. The other thing I want to mention is uh, if it's anything like the Comcast Aris routers, there is, a, by default, a public Wi-Fi being broadcast all over your neighborhood. And you might want to turn that off. They, get, they sent very few instructions with it it's like here's how to here's step one unplug your old one here's step two plug in the new one i mean there's it doesn't talk about that at all or they're not going to or nothing. they don't they do not uh, mm -hmm. uh, explain all that stuff and if you're expecting it you're going to have a very very long wait mm -hmm. i both comcast xfinity x5 and I astound, which in our area used to be RCN, but astound probably also does have a user community, very active online. Uh, there may be a Reddit, there may be some other active communities. And uh, all you got to do is look up astound, user to user support, go to the internet, you can get every kind of information anybody has on that thing, or okay. look up the Aris router, and you can get all the information on its settings. Just make sure you look up the correct model. <laughs> yeah, because there are uh, different <laughs> models uh, uh, with different features. Oh, another thing that your modem now will have that it may not have had before is DOCSIS 3.1, which allows well, additional features. Uh, your old one, you said was real old. It's probably a 3.0, and everybody should be on 3.1 minimum. And so you'll get better security now. I don't, I don't, I think that old wow one, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't even 3.0. I think it was 2.0. That oh. is very insecure these days. <laughs> uh, I've never seen one that old uh, because uh, generally uh, for a lot of years, 3.0 has been out. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to uh, probably go back 15, 20 years to get a, uh, uh, something less than 3.0 yeah, i think so but you're very limited also on a, a possible bandwidth with 3.0 you will get higher speeds with 3.1 yeah if you need if you need or want the gig speed you'd need 3.1 and you need a, a router that can do i think wi-fi 6 no, uh, uh, actually, uh, just five uh, handles it just fine. Okay. Uh, it's when you get into Ethernet, uh, you have to have a minimum of uh, Cat five E as an Edward, or six or higher. But uh, uh, usually, when you go much higher than six, you start getting into the uh, shielded uh, stuff like a hospital would use, and or uh, uh, fiber optics. In other words, you use what works, but don't go too high. <laughs> yeah, uh, actually, uh, for in-house uh, uh, gigabit, you're talking 5 e and 6. Now, right now, uh, uh, both uh, uh, T-Mobile and Comcast and AT&T, I know, are uh, going higher. Uh, AT&T's uh, uh, working on uh, uh, 5 uh, gigabit. 
and the others are working on 10 gigabit, well, boy, you're going to have to have some real big changes to get that kind of service in your house. And it's really for uh, AR, VR purposes. So if you're not going to get into AR, VR, you, uh, you're never going to probably go past the one gig uh, uh, a bit uh, mark. And even that's overkill for a lot of us. Oh, yes. that's uh, uh, overkill for the vast majority. And right now, uh, 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 those that are playing around with the VR, uh, uh, because it's uh, the head goggles uh, with the uh, controls in the hands with heptic uh, uh, feedback, a lot of them are doing this in their house. They don't know where the heck they really are because they're into the game or whatever it is they're looking at. And a lot of them are uh, starting to get injuries, falling downstairs and other things. <laughs> Not everybody. Don't don't be doom and gloom. I didn't say everybody, but uh, uh, there are a lot because I even hear the stories and uh, uh, on TV, and I also hear. Uh, it in uh, articles. And it's because uh, uh, they get so deep into whatever it is they're looking at, they don't remember what the, uh, the layout of the land is uh, uh, where they're at, and they end up uh, uh, harming themselves <laughs> accidentally. Has anyone here used VR? We well, saw Sanford, it at West Side you, once. Yeah, you did a demo once right i've used i've used it uh, a couple of times uh, a, a buddy of mine uh, the guy in wisconsin he he's really into it absolutely really enjoys the heck out of it um he loves meeting people online he likes uh touring places he does an exercise routine that uh every day he uses his vr goggles in like a wee setting and does his exercises and he'll play, uh, you know, could be tennis or some other games. And he's very busy in the house, doesn't go anywhere but his living room in that respect and doesn't fall down and doesn't get hurt. But, uh, you know, but anyone else here do it? Nobody. Nobody's tested it, tried it. Okay. Well, not, not beyond demos that people have done. Okay. I, I do know my eyes can handle it, whereas my eyes don't always handle things well that require stereoscopic vision. Right. And so it's, yeah, it's stereoscopic. It's whether your brain can handle it, you know, that. Uh, yeah, but the thing is, uh, I do have difficulties in that area. However, what your demo did work for me, eventually. Okay. Eventually it worked. Maybe you should try it, Bob. Eh. Maybe, maybe I mean, not. I've, I go, I go into the real outdoors, and I have a lot of stuff I do out there. I'm busy. Like <laughs> I got a whole DVR full of shows that I haven't watched. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I could, re I could reflect, I could understand that. Relate to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah but Bob, in, in the uh, the VR version, you can touch poison ivy, and it's okay. So. Ah, this is true. <laughs> I know a way of pre-treating so that I can touch poison ivy, and I'm okay. <laughs> Yeah, well, please send that to me, Bob, because my wife is very susceptible to it. She gets I, close to it and she erupts. <laughs> brand names, IVX. Oh, I, she, she uses that. And Technu. Technu okay. is uh, also a post-exposure treatment. Okay. Post-exposure. You put it on yourself or on the, on the poison ivy? Yeah. You, you put it on yourself. It acts as a barrier that prevents the oil from getting to your skin. Huh. You have to reapply it every four hours if you're active. And uh, you should also use the removal products and make sure you segregate your clothes that have been exposed and wash them hot, 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 dry them hot, hot, hot. And also leaving stuff out in the sunshine will deteriorate the oil too, but it takes a while. But you got to be really diligent about as soon as you can do the post exposure. We're okay, off, we're off topic here. <laughs> okay, but anyway, let's go to a new topic, Dennis. I think we've kind of addressed your yeah. concerns. 
Okay, um, so tell me, what do you think you're going to do? Are you going to keep both units going or are you going to keep one running? I think I'm going to totally try to go with just the errors. Okay, um, so I would just go IP address into it. They should give you the instructions on doing that and configure it with your new name that you're going to call it. Could be Dennis's house or whatever you're going to call it. And um, periodically go in, check and see if there's any firmware updates that need to be done, maybe every X number of months. And just to, and let it go. And then see if there's any other funky things uh, every now and then look and see who's connected to make sure everything in is connected that you want to be connected. There, there's a way to check who's connected. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. All routers have that uh, for years. Oh, absolutely. There's Maybe, a, you can pull up a list of every device that's connected up to your system. I'll bet every, uh, uh, your, even your old router, I'll, I'll lay you 10 to one says, has that capability in it to tell you every device currently uh, on that old router. And uh, if they're not your devices, that means somebody's figured out your passphrase and is uh, uh, using much, uh, mooching your uh, uh, service for their purposes. How do you look that up? How would you look up the list? Yeah. Oh, got you, IP address into the router, there should be uh, uh, the ability to pull that up. Let's see if I can pull, get this on mine. Uh, uh, Windows D. Yeah, and that's been on routers since, since day one. Since what, right. It has to be. <clears throat> Yeah, you can go into, uh, in the case of Comcast Xfinity, you can go through the website or through an app, and you can uh, get the list there. Uh, you can go in through that 10, 0, 0, whatever. And the, uh, well, I think uh, if uh, uh, Dennis is like mine, it should be uh, 192.168.0.1 to uh, uh, connect to it then uh, you have to have the admin account and it may or may not have a password. If it does have a password, it might be password or root. Or what? admin, or it will be printed on that label for the, uh, that came on, that's on the router itself. That came unless, you've, unless you've changed the password. Well, Which and that's the do. thing. That's one of the first things that uh, you got to do is change the password so that others can get in. The client view list. All right. So if you guys see here, this is my landing page of my router. This is an Asus router. And right here, there's something called view the list. And this is every device that's connected, uh, their IP address, their client name, what frequency they're on, what channel they're on, how long they've been on, yada, yada, yada. And you see there's the a Mac, ad Mac address too. and the Mac address. Thank you. And uh, you can export this for whatever reasons you want, but there's every one of your devices is connected to it. That's connected to it is on here. And there are also apps that you can put onto a computer or a smartphone, and you can see similar information from that end. Right. Uh, the, AV, AV, Avast, you can go into Avast and you can uh, check status and it'll give you a list of your devices. It doesn't give you the full amount of information, but it gives you all pretty much all the names of them, the ones that are connected. Yeah. Just remember the only way to be really sure that you're getting everything that is connected to that router is to go into the router because like if you I, do it through if you do it through your computer it's a little less reliable right the router is going to tell you everything everyone every device that's connected to it because it keeps a list that's the way think it works of a, think of a router as nothing more than a very simple computer all it does is act as a traffic cop that says okay modem you sent me signals or I'm going to send you signals 
And uh, uh, in the meantime, I will direct traffic as to where the uh, incoming signal goes to in this domain. And uh, uh, anything that those devices attach to that router will then uh, be filtered uh, uh, back into the modem, back out to the carrier. That's all it is. But you got to manage it. Okay. Uh, new questions, new direction. Is anybody out there, out there a golf player? Play golf? You got a new golf game? No, no. I, I was just. Um, a matter of interest for me personally, I was looking at the masters, you know, with Tiger, of course, but um, they had this drone, these drones showing the whole grounds and everything and all the clubhouses and then going in and out and everything else. It was really a spectacular sight. If you don't know, you've never been down to, to um, the masters down in Atlanta, play down there or anything. It really is a good, a fan, a fan, interesting experience, I should say. Look at and see how they do these. Uh, Quite a few of the golf courses, if you go to their websites, they let they have flyover available, which will yeah. take you right over the course and give and give you a flyover on yeah. individual holes or the whole thing. The, the added one about this, it, it took it through the clubhouse and the rooms and the wine cellars and everything. It was like, mm. wow. <laughs> see some vintages down there I want to get. Some McCallums, you know, 50-year-old and all that stuff. All the good stuff, huh? <laughs> Two thousand dollars a bottle. Anybody? Take <laughs> any takers? <laughs> yeah, drones are really neat. They're also used in news coverage these days. Mm. They get in really close, uh, as close as they're allowed to, to things like fires and rescues and stuff like that, where their helicopters aren't allowed to fly. But in USFL, um, down in Alabama on weekends. That they use drones all the, I think like eight or 10 people and each team has a drone, you know, from the quarterback to the, some of the, the guys who they snap the balls and other things. And Yeah. And there are, there are under the rules, some limits as to exactly what they can do by way of looking at that drone footage so that they don't catch each other's signals illegally. Uh -oh. As long as uh, uh, they don't do with the drones like uh, uh, Ukraine's do. Well, that's a different subject. Those are those are military different drones. Size drones. Those are military drones. They're useful too, but not for us. Well, I'm thinking in terms of the explosives they attach to it. Yeah, military oh. drones. But that's a different kind of drone. Right. Can we stay on computer topics here? Um, <laughs> well, these drones are kind of a computer thing. Yes, yes, they are. Um, so, so Stanford, could you take a cherry bomb and glue it in the glow plug from an old 049 engine on, mm -hmm. on the wick, Hi. put it on a small drone and then remotely fire off the glow plug and it would drop the cherry bomb. Okay. Why would I want to do that? I don't know. So, so you can sink a Russian warship. That's why. Uh, Easy, yeah. boy. Easy. Okay. Now we're off topic. I'll, yeah. I'll say. I'll say. I'll say this. No, it's no. extremely illegal in the United States to do something like that. Yeah. You right. cannot weaponize an aircraft. Period. Okay. If it's considered an airplane, you cannot weaponize an airplane unless you're military. We'll just leave it alone at that. Um, Carl, I sent you a text, a chat. Can you take a look at it and respond back to me, please? Do we have any other further questions or comments for our open forum? No. Well, one simple question. Yes, Bill. I'm tired of typing in my uh, ID. Mm. Is there anything that I can use uh, with a hotkey? where it would fill in my ID all the time. So you're, now you're I, saying this is not like LastPass or something you could use LastPass for? No, this is just uh, when I, every, every website I go to because I don't, I don't. Um, save the passwords? I don't save the passwords and stuff. Uh, when I go into a website, it asks me for my ID. And 
normally when I go in the first time, I'll copy it. So I have it in the, um, uh, that I can copy and paste, but uh, sometimes I, I type stuff over it. And just wondering if there's something easy that I could use that would allow me to, uh, to always just paste in my ID rather than have to type it all the time. You're just uh, describing any kind of a password manager. I use LastPass for over 10 years. Yeah, I'm aware I can do that. But I have it does exactly what you're asking. Right. And you don't and you can use uh, 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 LastPass and the other password managers have a, a, a password generator and you can have it generate secure passwords. It remembers it. The only thing you have to remember is how to log into each of your accounts and the master password, or actually not a password, but a passphrase that you use in whatever uh, uh, password manager you set up to use. I just uh, helped uh, Tom O'Connor uh, set his up. Okay. Bill, Bill, is that kind of what you're looking for? Or are you looking for something different? Well, it's not only the password uh, manager for things that I, I use regularly. It's uh, when I go to a sale website and they want me to enter my ID or whatever and that kind of stuff as well. Okay. I, now, I why don't you why don't you use your like a password manager in your browser to save it? Uh, I haven't thought of doing that. That's what I use, uh, LastPass uh, extensions in all my browsers. Okay, but he's just looking for like his ID to get into if he's buying stuff, not his That's, password. Yeah, he just wants his I ID use it here. for that. I use it for uh, medical, for the uh, pharmacy. Anything that's online that requires a login is in my LastPass. I also have secure notes. All my computers, I have a, 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 an entry in there per computer to identify it, the administrator's password, the standard user's password, and if I happen to use a PIN number with that uh, standard account, I have that there too. What the heck else? Okay, I mean, Bill is Bill is very familiar with LastPass because I think you did something about Last. Or use a different password manager, didn't you? No, uh, I've I've watched you guys do the presentations. Okay, but, but I've never used a password manager. Okay, I thought I remember you were using no, something I like that. Um, it, I just never done. So, so there, there's your couple of options that you can use to to do this. You can use a password manager that's built into your browser to manage your logins. Uh, you don't have to use it for the password; just for your login itself. And then whatever what technique you want to use for password management, or some or a password manager uh, utility such as LastPass. Actually, what most browsers do is they offer to save your password, not your login ID. Right. And that's exactly the opposite of what we want to accomplish here. Right. Exactly. <laughs> he just wants his login ID done. Right. And uh, sticky notes. Sticky notes. Yeah. Is it uh, is it always the same login ID at all sites? Almost always. Then you could use an autofill and you could get either an application that's autofill or hotkey for autofill or uh, other things are available in the operating system or the browser. But you would just want to put it in as an autofill item. If it's the... Uh, the user ID for the site, you could open up a notepad document and just copy and paste it from there. As long as it's, as yeah. long as the username and the password aren't in the same document. Right? Yeah. The, the quickest, easiest thing to do is just set it up as a hotkey. Uh, that's what I wanted to do is set it up as a hotkey, but I don't know how. I, I think there is a way in Windows 11 that you can have an autofill hotkey. I'm on 10. 10 can also do it, I believe. I don't recall how, because I haven't done it in a while. I do it in Linux, not in, not in Windows. <clears throat> Anybody oh, okay. know of a Bob that could be programmed to do that for you? Well, there's already stuff already programmed that'll do it. 
uh, if where you could just have a fob like you have for the car, you want, when you want to need need to log in with your login, you just hold the fob up and click it and put you in oh, there. Yeah, a fob like a YubiKey fob. That's uh, a possibility, and yet it's I. Uh, it's really applying a sledgehammer to driving a <laughs> fine nail. <laughs> it's pretty window. expensive. All right, look in Windows 10 and see if I can find a hotkey. Okay, and yeah. then, uh, then Bill, you can let us know in our, one of our next meetings okay. uh, how you found the hotkey and, and how you implemented it to solve this, this little technique. Just I uh, auto auto hotkey may have been rele relegated to an app. It may come from the store. Okay. But uh, you can definitely look up online auto hotkey app and you can find programs that'll do it. You can find simple ones. You can find fancy ones and uh, you can find ways of doing it in windows. Got it. Well, windows is set up so that you can use a thumbprint or a fingerprint, or you can use a pin number or you can use facial recognition and stuff to do things with. Why can't something like that be adapted? Because uh, Windows Hello and all these other things apply only to log into the device. It's a BIOS thing. Mm. It's firmware. OK. OK, uh, let's uh, any other last questions? Any? Anybody have any announcements? Aha! Uh Aha! -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. I have one, yeah. The first uh, meeting of the CCS Investment SIG will be on the second Thursday, uh, June 9th, uh, like starting around 7. Um, uh, my daughter, the high school teacher, is going to co-host, um, and the hot topics for this month will be cryptocurrency. Uh, it's, well, obviously, the main theme, theme will be taxes 20, 2021, but the hot topics this now are uh, cryptocurrency and FBAR, foreign bank uh, account uh, reporting. Um, the government IRS cracking down on these areas. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll be talking about those. So first uh, I'll have uh, with the correct link and uh, we'll have a nice uh, agenda announcement, uh, you know, starting uh, first of June. And uh, we hope you'll all want to join in. We'll have open discussion and uh, We'll get some good experts in there, like Stanford and Tim, to <laughs> help with some of the technical stuff. Uh, <laughs> questions, <laughs> not me, but uh, so we hope you'll all be able to join us on Thursday, May, June 9th. What is the uh, the purpose of your SIG? The underlying overall per or the overall purpose of your SIG? Well, 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 we'll be providing information and. Uh, answering some questions uh, people may have um, uh, in investments or other areas. We will not be discussing individual stocks. If you want to uh, like uh, General Motors or Ford or whatever, we, I mean, you want to say you, you bought a motor stock and it tanked or whatever, but we will not be specific naming uh, specific individual stock names. And we're, no, we're not going to recommend it. If you want to invest, uh, you know, go in a mutual fund and, you know, uh, high risk, low risk, whatever. Are you going to be talking about different software packages that are available for investors? Uh, I, we can save that for the second, uh, our, our second meeting in July. Uh, okay, well, but I'm meaning um, just in general, is that one of the things you're going to be talking about? Is like investment software, is different software to yes. use? Yes, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make that the agenda for the second. Uh, uh, we got to space this out. We can't cover everything in one night. So we'll uh, we'll, we'll cover that on the uh, July meeting. Okay. That'll be the agenda for that uh, investment uh, types, uh, investment types and uh, various softwares. And including uh, stuff that you're, if you're uh, tracking your investments at home, uh, 
uh, some of the investment tracking uh, software as well. I, as I was discussing before this meeting started being recorded, I, I am also scheduled to do a couple of topic presentations at CCS meetings regarding cryptocurrency and NFTs. And the first one, if they, if there's enough time, we will be doing it South Suburban, which will be cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. And it's just going to be basics, 20,000 foot overview. And I, at the August West Side meeting, NFT, Ethereum, and the Metaverse. And that will again be just a 20,000 foot overview. Okay, thank you, Terry. <laughs> thank you. Um, before I start our meeting, I just want to know, is anyone familiar with Te uh, Ken DeGilio? Okay, well, he's trying to been trying to join our meeting for a while, and he keeps getting picked out before he can get in. I, I'm not familiar with this name. That's why I thought I'd ask the group if they recognize it. All right, uh, with that, uh, any other last questions? Otherwise, we'll go into our topics for the evening. Uh, Sanford Ken is a member. Okay, thank you. I, I just didn't recognize Ken. Where, where is he? Uh, which region? Um, two. It's okay, it's not important. No. South. Okay. Um, he, uh, like I said, he's been trying to join for the last twenty minutes, and he, he, he can't. He must have device issues or something. Um, anyways. Sounds like Big Hendrick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could be too. Hey, Mike, um, you're still there. <laughs> All right, so I sent out a bunch of topics for tonight, and uh, and and some t some of them are actually just straight tips. One of the first ones that I uh, that I didn't put in there, but it's I put it into my notes here, is a particular program called here. I'll pull I'll pull up first thing. Let me share my screen. I'm sorry, I'm being a little erratic here. Let me pull up my Zoom, and I'm going to. Share screen with the topics. But oh, all right. The very first one is uh, because Tim was requesting this one. Um, the dilemma that uh, Tim had noted, I, I run into this, and probably everyone runs into this, is the more you take pictures, the more you wind up with duplicates. And the more you start stuffing them onto your hard drives, the more, more often you have duplicates. But the problem comes is actually filtering and finding these duplicates. And you could look for the same file name. That's an easy thing to do in relative terms. But to find pictures that look identical, but they could be a different, it could be the next photo in the shot. This software that is a free software that's out there, it's an open source, but it's old. It has not been updated, I think, since 2013. Um, so it is old. Uh, it's probably a 16 bit, could be a 32 bit, I don't know, but I don't think it's a 16 bit. Probably 32 bit. Uh, 32 -bit. It does run in Windows 10, because uh, I just loaded it on here, and that's called VisiPix. And I am going to illustrate that one in just a second here. Let me. New share, and it's going to be, there you go. All right, so this is VisiPix, what it looks like. And I went ahead and ran a scan on a particular folder that I've done. This folder is all the photos that I scanned uh, via my bed scanner or my, my document scanner. So I've scanned uh, 10,586 pictures. Oh. People don't believe I have a lot of pictures. I have a hundred, I just did a count the other day to see how many I have on my server. I have 150,000 photos on my server. Oh. So now you understand why I have a server because I have a lot of pictures. <laughs> so what, what this did is um, the way this program works is kind of neat is you, in the middle here, you choose the folders 
that you want to scan and you could scan multiple folders on the right hand side there is an add or subtract from which folders you want to scan so you add a folder to this group or you if you mistakenly hit it twice or something you could take it away um, you can adjust how loose or how tight the similarities will be right now i have it set at basic and then i just choose the play button which actually starts finding the process now it's a very slow pro, uh, software regardless of what processor you're using it just is slow because of the way it was written it's not a, it's not multi-threaded for sure so this was 10,500 and and change uh, pictures and it took it a half hour to find the duplicates of this it found uh, 1284 dupes that I had scanned and a very good probability is uh, you know I when I got the tubs of all the photos that I needed to scan we probably had duplicate prints that were made and um, you know we often did that when we had photos printed we would have duplicates done and they would be in different places and I wouldn't know that this caught them so on the left hand side it will show you the the photos and the group of them if you could see the top line where I have it marked um, you could have uh, it shows there's two of them and if you look down to the fourth one you can see there's four of them keep going and you can see all the different thumbnails of the pictures. And when you hover over it, it actually shows you on the screen the individual photo. So if I hover over the one on the left, it's showing me that one. The one on the right, it'll show you that one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I found this, uh, this is a very good software to use. And you can, oh, and when you're in here, you can individually choose the photo you want to keep or kill. And then when you're done, you just go over to the, I think this is the red button. Uh, no, that would be stop. You would then go to actions on the right side and you can delete them or you can move them to another place. I think um, Bill Powell, I think was the one who showed me this software. I've well, used I, it for years. Yes. And I, years. yeah, and it's, it's a it's a little it's okay it's not the best thing i've ever used but it solves serves a purpose here and it does a great job of handling all finding all these duplicates it's just a little slow in getting the task done so it's called VisiPix, and um go out there you can search for it i literally downloaded and installed this just the other day and had it up and running <coughs> Okay, uh, let me minimize that one. And we're gonna. Sanford? Yes, sir. Uh, on the same subjects of photography. Yes. I noticed uh, in Explorer and in most of the other uh, file programs that they got rid of uh, thumbnails. Oh, isn't that nice of them? How do I get them back? I think there's a setting for that, but I won't swear to it. Are you on 10 or 11? 10. Well, you said it's your, is it your, is it Ex individual program you're using that does it, or are you saying Windows? Win Windows Explorer. Windows Explorer. You go into view and it'll show you large or standard or small uh -huh. images. But that's, no, it doesn't anymore. Yeah, it does. Then something changed yours. Yeah, you may have a setting that uh, uh, changed whether you did it or not. So, so that would be uh, here. Let me show you this screen here, and you can see CCS here, and I go up here to view. Yeah, there's and your right icon. now I have it on details, but if I go to large icons. Um, if they were photos, they would show up as photos in here, but they don't because oh. these are all documents. Yeah, but there's an option uh, uh, for uh, being able to see uh, 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 kind of like a, uh, an Apple Peak uh, uh, operation. It shows up in the left 
column, I mean the right column, excuse me, the right column, it'll give you a, a, a kind of like a thumbnail of what a, a picture would be in a particular folder if you hover over it. So what, what, what part of the software is picking that up? Is that part of Microsoft software or is it something else? Now it's a Microsoft software, or at least uh, uh, that's what I'm remembering. I don't use the feature myself, but I remember reading about it. Urban <laughs> view, when you do when you do pictures through Urban view, there's a setting there somewhere in there, and I never have been able to never turned it off and never really tried to, but it, it puts out thumbnails and it, it makes a file for them, and you usually find it on your desktop an icon for it. Yeah, and Urban View is still around, so you can uh, yep. it's, use that too. It's, up, it's, it's being kept up to date pretty regularly. In uh, Urban View, the thumbnail viewer is an add-on. It's a plugin. Okay. And uh, it's a very standard one. You usually will download it, but it's a separate download and a separate install and a separate upgrade. Yeah, there's, there's about two or three things with Urban View that you have when you do an upgrade, you kind of got to go through and pick up the other odd, the odd ones and pick them up at the same time. Yeah, I pick up two components, two components. And I, I believe Windows does have a, an ability to do that kind of a peak function. It isn't called peak in Windows because Windows peak shows you your desktop. Uh, so there's some kind of a thumbnail view. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to find where to activate that. Looking it up now. You. Oh, you can get video thumbnail viewer from the Microsoft Store and Nap. Thumbnail previews. There's also how to display image thumbnails in Windows 10 Microsoft. Okay. I, I've got it. Thumbnails are not showing in Windows 10 11. No, this is substituting thumbnails for icons. So to enable or disable thumbnail view for pictures in Windows and enable thumbnails for files on Windows 10, you open the File Explorer, the View tab, Options button, Source Windows Central, and it, it gives it a, a thing on how to turn it on and off. Okay. I, it's folder options. And it's, it's file explorer options. Okay. And yeah. it's view. Always show icons, never thumbnails, uncheck. So where? Let's see whether I can find it on my computer. Yeah, it's going to file explorer. Uh, look at uh, 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 the folder options view, and uh, he said uncheck uh, uh, icons, and it'll uh, do it by thumbnail. Change folder options. Windows folder options. View. Folder options is uh, under File Explorer options, and it's a pop-up screen. Right. And the tab view is a tab, and then you've got this big long list. And always show icons, never thumbnails is the top one under Files and Folders. Unselect that, and you get the the thumbnails. Should. Display file icon on thumbnails is another option. And those are the two main ones. Okay, so I'm going to. So let me put the reference into chat. 
so everybody can follow along. First, I'll copy it out of my browser, then I'll put it in chat. Now, where is Zoom? <laughs> There's Zoom. You're using Zoom. You're on Zoom. All right. While they're doing so, hopefully we can cover that. There it is. In the thing. chat. Thank you. Um, and by unselecting it, the pictures came up in regular Explorer. Did they? Yes, Good. they did. Good. So problem solved? Problem solved. Good problem job, Bob. Solved. Good okay. Job. So now I have a question. Um, Windows 10 and 11 have been assigning unique icons to Actions in File Explorer, or that is when you're looking at other computers on your system, it'll give them funky little icons um, next to the item. Now it may not be like a picture of somebody, but it could be, and I gotta see if I could pull this up any place. To see if I could find how this was doing this. Is it? I'm sorry, I'm not being complete on here. My thought here. And I wanted to know if there's a way to identify what in the world do these symbols mean. So uh, let's see if I can find this. Find something that does help. This PC. All right, so let's kind of go through my computer right here and I'll share this screen. All right, so this is just simple. So look at my C drive. It's, yep. got, an, it's got an unlock on here. Well, what does that mean? It's okay. Oh. Is it encrypted or is it not? Well, what is the, what, the answer is yes, it's encrypted. It uses BitLocker, but how am I supposed to know what this lock is supposed to? It means that lock means that lock means BitLocker is engaged. Engaged. Yeah. Okay. My point is, where's the cheat sheet for these icons? At Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. Bill Redmond, uh, Washington. That's. The, but there's no place for me to see what these are. Oh, let's see. I was trying to open up something. Probably not. Okay, some of these are not doing it what I want it to do. Um, I, I think I, they're not icons. I think they're badges. That's it. So I've seen these badges and, and they come up at different times. Right now, everything looks okay on this file explorer. I'm not seeing anything that's uh, that was unusual. But I was using this the other day and I had a whole bunch of badges that showed up next to things. And I'm going, what the hell does this mean? And I couldn't understand it. And I didn't take a screenshot to be able to illustrate to other people what I was seeing. And I'm sorry, I didn't do that, but uh, this is not helping at all. So badges, my question is, how do I find uh, more or less a cheat sheet for the badges? Actually badges seems only to, I. Uh... Let's see. Badges, I does not apply to this particular thing. Okay. Let's see if I can find. Sanford, are you talking about the icons that come up when you're in OneNote or a OneDrive? It could be one on one. Yes, yes, it could be there. And that has to do with whether you want to download it or not to your system or whether it's already on there. That's the kind of badges you're talking about. Okay. Uh, but here again, where where is these cheat sheets to know what this stuff is? How are we supposed to know this? When they uh, converted it about five years ago, four years ago, uh, they talked about it. Oh, so, so I need a Wayback Machine. Yes. I, th I think if you want to look up something related to OneDrive files, okay. uh, you might find it there. All right. Okay, that will probably help. Um, okay, that was a little bit uh, different direction. On my screen, I have uh, posted some tips and some uh, and other topics. 
one of the things that I had here as a tip is this new um, streaming service that I heard about. It's called uh, Cine Sign House. Uh, it's, a, it's an ad supported streaming service that offers de uh, 12 dedicated linear channels, very much like your cable TV does. You have actual channels, could be uh, channels, could be action, it could be um, horror, it could be Carol Burnett shows, um, uh, it, it, things like that would be a, ch a channel, if you will. And this one, Again, it's free and they have lots of options here. They got premium channels, spotlights, um, new arrivals, blah, 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 true crime, popular TV shows and period stuff. So there's, there's, all, there's all kinds of good stuff on here. And if you're in dire need of more stuff to watch <laughs> and a new place to get content, Feel free to have at it. It's you know you're you can maybe get rid of your Netflix accounts or your other online streaming service and just go with something like this. If you don't mind some older stuff, it's all it's here. So I don't know if anyone here has used this before or seen this site before, but I heard about it just last week. So I thought I'd put post it in the uh, in the tips. All right. Anyone got a comment on this? No. So let's go to our topics. I'll go back just a second on the in the taskbar in settings. If you go to taskbar, one of the choices on there is to show badges on taskbar buttons. Yeah, that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> no, I that was a couple of times back when he was talking about badges on stuff or things like that lock and that. I think that might apply to some of those. I'm looking right now at an article in How to Geek that explains the new Windows 11 file explorer, what it looks like, and what all these weird changes are. Okay. And new icons is covered. Ah, okay. And it's just a new set of icons. It doesn't explicitly say that there are badges. They're just new icons. It doesn't cover every last one of them. Thank you, Bob. Let me, let me see if I can get another link from here. All right. Well, Official... on that, let's go to yeah. our next topic for the evening. Does anyone have anything on here that they thought was interesting? I, I was looking at the topic further down. Use your laptop to monitor living space through built-in camera. Ah, okay. Let's see where that one's at. You should to monitor. There it is. Well, that one should be pretty easy to do, don't you think? Open hyperlink. Share. And here we go. How to turn your laptop into a home security system. Oh, that's pretty. Do you pretty want to cool. talk about that a little bit, Sanford? Uh, Do I want... A laptop in the home security system? Well, that's what we're doing. Okay, great. Okay. All right. Um, so I guess you, you need to uh, download a program. First thing, your, your laptop would have to have a camera on it. Um, and if beneficial if it had a microphone too if it doesn't have a camera it's per it has no purpose for you they won't do this so you need to download one of these programs they're 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 illustrating here something like uh why y'all y'all cam y'all cam i spy security spy and there's some other ones out there you can go and search for them there's so you need a webcam program to do this yeah, of course, we always get the pop ups that say join me, sign up. And when you download one of these programs, it should turn it all on. It should turn on your webcam and it won't, it'll leave it on while your power is running. So you want to make sure you have uh, AC power running to this thing. And then you got to put it someplace 
so that you could be monitoring what you wanted to see. So I was wondering, would it be possible to actually use an old desktop? Oh, well, it doesn't have to, the answer would be yes. Um, as long as the desktop has a camera, you could hook it, you'd need to hook a camera up to it. If it doesn't, if it doesn't have one, Pete. Right. You can and then you would go and like follow the setting, follow the instructions that are on here, and it should walk you through what you needed to do. And of course, you're going to need to, you could have it do the recording, but what you wanted to do is you wanted to send that information to another computer so that you're monitoring what that computer is seeing. So you're going to probably have to put in another version of that software either on your phone or on another computer so that whatever this one your laptop or your desktop is recording and seeing it's going to be transmitted to another machine that you can uh, intercept that information and be able to look at it is that what you wanted to do pete or are you going to want it to just do local recording six and one half a dozen of the other and you probably be able to do that um, on here. I don't know if you can do both <coughs> with these softwares or not. You're gonna have to trial and error and see which one does what. And Pete, you know, next month or after you get a chance to get through one of these, let us know what your experience is if you do it. You know, did it work? Did it not work? This is what you found. Or anybody in the group. Uh, so it looks like you can have it save look in this one. This is that Y cam or YAM cam. Uh, you can have it send it to a file. You can FTP it, HTTP stream it, or you can also have, um, looks like motion is an option on this one. Uh, can you notify, can it notify the police or does it send out an alarm uh, or, or how does it work? No, yeah, these will not notify the police. Uh, you that gets tricky if you're going to have software that's actually going to notify the police it's got in i think it's in illinois i don't know about every every other every state but you're going to want to have a service do that because i think in illinois the police will not respond to a machine generated call unless it's a fire department and, I, and that may not be true too. I think the fire department actually has to have a service too. Um, they will not take just a, something popping up on a board or get an automated single, signal from somebody and expect to respond to it because there's too many false alarms. So they, they require in Illinois, I think a service to actually do it and a person make the phone call. But I could be wrong. This is what I remember some years ago uh, when I was talking to the fire department about that, they told you me that you could set up set off a large alarm, which might scare them away. Well, Sanford. Well, you're going. Hey, Terry, Terry, I think you're trying to do you're trying to do a lot more than what these are designed to do. Oh, okay. These are just oh. for monitoring purposes. That's it. It, it that's there. There's no action going on here. If you're looking for a security service. That's a security system. Uh, Bill? Yeah, uh, I was interested in what you said that the police won't respond or the fire. What about an Apple Watch that has fall detection? Um, it goes to 911. Still a service. Yeah, but it, you, you got a point there. It will dial 911. However, the police is going to, um, they want to hear a voice on the other end. When the call is they generally won't come unless they hear a voice or they think there's a person in distress because i think when you fall your speaker is turned on and your microphone is turned on so you you're supposed to be able to have a two-way conversation with the police department if they can hear something then they you know and they can determine there might be somebody over there in distress they will come but there's an aud there's an actual audible connection going on here is what I was trying to get at. It's not just 
a notification popping up on their screen. Okay. At least that's my understanding of how that works. Yeah, it is a 911 call, which is way different from an automatic notification. Right. It's a 911 call, which you're going to a person that's going to pick up the phone there, and they're going to listen for somebody else on the other end. They're not going to respond to just to data or something showing up. Of course, when your watch or your iPhone calls 911, it's supposed to give information, at least on the iPhone will. They'll give information to the operator that is your name and could give GPS location so, if they're set up to receive it. Not all 911 centers have the ability to receive GPS location information or geolocation information. Okay. Okay. Again, that's my understanding. But I but that is again, this is not the purpose of this software yeah, here. This is just basically taking a laptop and turning it into a webcam that you can view remotely. Yep. So you could try that. Um so it also will looks like it can stream. Yeah, it does. Now they're only talking about this yam uh yam cam. Right. Uh, software that's on here. Let me go back up towards the top. I'm sorry if I'm scrolling too fast. Um, so you you need to again. Uh, I'd like somebody else to try this and see how this works. Uh, what's this? One plus ten Pro is a streamlined attack. Oh, I don't know what the hell this guy's talking about. <laughs> attack on the flagship phone market whatever that is going about <laughs> yeah <clears throat> yeah there i don't know what they're trying to sell here but uh so it, it, this can be relatively simple to do you put this software on you may have to fiddle with some of the controls and you got to make sure you put the laptop at a place that it can see and hear what's going on be cautious about audio though in the state of illinois so, you know, although, you know, if it's only you to you, it doesn't matter, or your family to your family. But if you're recording this and, and you got strangers walking in and you're watching this somewhere else, realistically, they're supposed to be notified that you're recording audio and video in the state of Illinois. You, you can put up a cameras, but by the way, you're on the Oh, yeah. What was that, Pete? You can put up placard signs if it's in a business. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, definitely if it's in a business, you just put a sign up that says, you know, video and video recording in progress or whatever you want to do. Um, I, it's it's audio in the state of Illinois. It's not video is the culprit. We have very strict audio recording laws. So I wonder why. <laughs> Could it be you don't have any politicians that are honest? Uh, I don't know. Easy, easy, easy now. Watch it. <laughs> what? Watch, watch it. Be careful. The, an the answer is yes. Leave Chicago alone. They're all honest. Up there. <laughs> okay. From there. So, you know. <laughs> I thought that was actually a pretty good topic there. It's a short one. It's easy to do. I'd like somebody to try this. Um. And let us know. Does anyone have camera or laptops hanging around? They got nothing to do with. I, I may try it on a, a spare desktop. Okay. With a webcam attached to it. Only because I've got some ideas, and uh, it might work for that, especially if I can stream it. And I can see maybe in your place, if you just had a uh, you know a webcam running, people won't think nothing of it. The fact that it's on there in that place, they'll walk by and see a laptop going and oh yeah okay, they'd ignore it, right? Because you've got computers all over the place. Yeah, there's. <coughs> or you could put one on a particular machine, and you could see who's using it at that time. <laughs> I'm going to take one of my web one of my cameras. I've got a, one of the microscope cameras, and yep. 
I'm going to hang it off my uh, my zip line here and attach it to the head head of my router so that I can use the router as an X Y location using the pendant to actually transcribe the location. Okay. Because I've run into some jobs where I get an, an object and I need to get a, make a file to duplicate the object. And typically the object is like three foot by five foot. Okay. And well, Pete, let us know how this works for you, okay? Okay. All right, and, and again, anybody else in the group that tries this out, give us some feedback on that. All right, next topic that's on my list here. What about that one on safe mode? Safe mode. <clears throat> Let's see, where's safe? Troubleshooting mode? with safe mode or something like that was. There it is. Safe mode diagnosis. Huh. Oh, Kim Commando. Okay, so it's how to use safe mode to diagnose your problems with your computer. And uh, is it, first thing, has anyone here done this before to use safe mode? And, okay. There are, th there are things for which I've had to go into safe mode. Um, so, how do you get to safe mode? Yeah, that's a trip and a half in and of itself. It yeah. is. It actually <laughs> is. It used to be real simple to go into safe mode. In the old days, you used to press what? Um, F8. F8. Yeah. You got rid of F8. Isn't, then, it, isn't it if you hit hold the shift key down and um, hit restart, won't that get you to safe mode? It will get you to the screen that lets you choose troubleshooting options. Right. From there, you then go into another screen, and I think two screens after that, you can choose safe mode. Okay. And it'll restart in safe mode. Yep. Yes. There well, is also a shift shutdown at the shutdown screen. And once you've logged out, you can do a shift shutdown, and that will, I think, pop up the option of restarting in safe mode. So they're telling you here you want to um do the windows key i go to settings the yep. start buttons uh, are, are settings update security you need to get to the recovery screen advanced startup restart right. now. boy they they just make this <laughs> why the hell is it got to be hard and and in windows 11 it's probably even harder it's about the same in windows 11. yeah well oh, here well, it's got the instructions Another option in both 10 and 11 is to bring up a, a, a run option, uh, type in uh, MS config, and you can select the, uh, the uh, type of safe mode you want and reboot. When you go into the safe mode, uh, you can do whatever you want to. Then you go into MS config and say, I want to uh, change this back to normal operation. Otherwise, if you restart it without that second change, it will uh, keep coming back in the safe mode. Oh, I see, by, by doing it that way. All right, yeah. so let's uh, kind of, this, this procedure here that's on this screen, it's very helpful to know this, but when your computer is having problems, you're not gonna have the screen up in front of you and, and on top of that, it's going to be, how are you going to do this? You got one, you've got one computer. How are you going to know what settings to go through when you have to follow this menu here on specific courses to actions? Complicated. They, they make it hard. But let's, oh, yeah. 
why does a person, let me ask, why did, and I ask this openly, why does a person need to go into safe mode? Uh, it's, uh, sometimes that uh, you get uh, uh, little issues that uh, the only way to uh, safely clean them up is go into safe mode. It'll heal itself. But also when you get into major problems with your system, strange behavior, you go into safe mode to disable all your drivers except uh, uh, some basic uh, uh, drivers. And then you can uh, uh, troubleshoot uh, a lot of stuff. You can run um, SFC space slash scan in a command line in order to be able to check out all your critical uh, boot up uh, files for Windows, whether it's 10 or 11 or even eight. There's lots of uh, uh, reasons for going into it. You just don't want to have those reasons in the first place. I, I, I can remember having to use it a lot when we were constantly changing hardware in like Windows 95 and 98. Sure. Yeah. Where you'd have all sorts of issues. I had a guy give me a computer once and I didn't know the password. And by going into safe mode, I just went to admin, created another account, and set up a password of my own. I don't know if that still, uh, I don't know if that still works, but uh, well, you used work. to be able to do that. Yeah, I, I don't think you can do that, but uh, because to go in the administrator's no, mode, no, no, you got to know what the password is, unless you can activate. Uh, before you try and go in a safe mode, the supreme uh, uh, administrator of the computer's account, which is normally disabled. I don't know, it worked. You lucked out then. Is everyone there? Yep. Okay, got real quiet there, sorry. Uh, okay, so uh, we kind of covered this. Is everyone clear on how to um, get in the safe mode and why you want to go in the safe mode? Yeah, one other thing about safe mode, it's not just drivers, it's also services, which are not active. Yeah. And Windows services gets into an area of malware, where you might have something malicious on there that is running a service that prevents you from seeing some things. Rootkits can do that. And there are other ways that malware can prevent you from seeing or make you see in File Explorer something that isn't really what's there. And in safe mode, sometimes you can uh, do an end run around that because the services that would normally be going are not running. Yeah, you're uh, in safe mode. You are uh, just barely running uh, Windows. And so there are a lot of things in safe mode uh, that you cannot do like you do in normal run mode. And it doesn't look as good or sound as good either because the drivers you're using are uh, a lower grade standard uh, uh, default drivers that they use for video and audio. Yeah, you'll be in Windows drivers, not your manufacturer's drivers. Right. Those almost always use software and services. It's bare minimum. Uh, uh, and that, uh, uh, because otherwise, if you're in normal mode, uh, Everything that's running in services and uh, 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 the uh, various drivers and so forth, those are all protected to prevent change uh, uh, while you're uh, uh, using the system. So the only way to deal with them is going into safe mode because they're now all deactivated. Now I can uh, make changes uh, perhaps a driver wouldn't update in normal mode. So I go into safe mode and try and update it uh, uh, there. 
the driver is no longer in use, so odds are it will uh, install correctly. And then you can go back into normal mode and it's using the new driver. There's also, there's also some software like antivirus software I, where you need to go into safe mode if you want to remove it. Yeah. Norton is like that. McAfee is like that. Avast is like that. Lots of them. Uh, there's more than just those three. Oh, yeah. Those are just examples. What is it? But what? typically, typically an antivirus program has drivers and services, and it will protect itself that's when right. you're running normal Windows. And that's what you want. Yeah. But if you want to remove it, then you have to get into a safe mode or boot into some kind of a removal program that's on a USB stick. And you may have to disable secure boot. Would it, wouldn't it be a good idea to do or create a restore point before you do any of these things? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Okay, but, so that would be a course of action if you if our attendees have never done it, you may want to do uh, create a restore point uh, before you go and do any other changes. If you haven't done it in a while, you may want to go. Windows should be creating restore points, should, but it may not be doing it by default because who knows what the hell Windows has done these days. Well, I mean, Windows 10 and Windows 11 by default have by what's called protection or restore points turned off. Right. If you turn it on by default, it uses a tiny, tiny percentage of your uh, of your drive, especially if it's an SSD, and you may have to expand that. There's and a slider. To, and uh, uh, to add uh, Sanford's, uh, besides the restore point, if you really think you're gonna be going in and doing uh, a draconian uh, uh, style changes, uh, because you're having issues, I'd have a backup, a complete image backup, because you could hose the whole system, but at least with a, a full image backup, you can get back to your original uh, uh, issue and try again and again and again. Right. Until you get it right. Um, and then, now I did. I did have a case to use a restore point uh, a little while ago, and it wasn't that I was doing any major things. Uh, I actually was updating um, some software. What was it? Um, Handbrake. I was updating Handbrake. And I had some settings that I implored or put into my original version of Handbrake. And when I went and upgraded to the new version of Handbrake, it overwrote those settings, which affected how I was able to use the program, and I was no longer able to use it the way I was using it before. So I was at a panic. How do I get these settings back? Can I just load in the, the other version of Handbrake? No, it was in Handbrake itself. So I just did a restore point, and for whatever reason, it worked. Um, it corrected my problem of the upgrade that I did to handbrake and it worked just fine. So, you know, here it wasn't a backup and it's not as draconian as doing a full system restore to fix a little bug. You know, it, it's yeah. okay. Because as Tim is saying, you want to do a backup. Well, that means you got to do a restore. And if you have a lot of data or you have a large hard drive or your external is slow, it could take a half hour, it could take an hour, it could take hours to restore that drive, depending upon how much data you got to move and what your interface is for, for just a simple fix, if you will. So consider that is know how to get to your restore points, how to create them and how to utilize them. Uh, Sanford, you were mentioning handbrake. Yeah. Uh, just a little aside, uh, a little sidebar on handbrake. It requires the use of a .NET version, which is now out of support. Right, and that was the problem I had is uh, the an older version did not use, use that net, .NET. Oh, and make, that, that brings up a point about Handbrake. Do not download the .NET version that they have linked on their webpage. Go and search for it on at Microsoft's site 
and download it from Microsoft directly because the link that they have on the on Handbrake site loads in something that's not correct. I, and I don't know, it doesn't work. It, well, the, the problem is it's an unsupported .NET and you cannot run Handbrake on the current .NET. Right. That's why I also went back. I did a, a, you know, I did a restore from a restore point, and I, all those problems went away that that .NET had created. So there's well, my. The, head. the thing is, if you go to Microsoft, I challenge you to find .NET six. It isn't there. No, there. Were, I did get something from them. I don't remember what it was, but I wound up blowing it all out and sticking with yeah. what I had. Um, well, I. Here's what I do with Handbrake. I run it under Ubuntu Linux. Okay. There, you don't run into these issues. There are other issues with Ubuntu and Handbrake, but it was originally, uh, Handbrake was meant to be used under Linux. Right. And I so Handbrake. that's what I do. I do use Handbrake um, when I'm, I have my RIP DVDs that are sitting on my, uh, whether it's on a server or sitting somewhere on a hard drive, and I decide I want to make a portable copy of them instead of having the large seven gigs file that's the VOBs. Uh, yeah. What's that? Uh, is that Visual Object Basic or something? I don't know. Object Binary, something. VOB files that are on a DVD versus an MP4. And what the handbrake will do is it will identify the chapters or that is the movie portion and then compress it down to an MP4 so you can take this as a portable version along with you. Yeah, I believe that's also something that the program Miro can do and that has no problems in Windows. Right. I, it was something that Format Factory would do but I definitely do not recommend Format Factory currently. It installs malware. It's yeah, it's it's plagued with a lot of malware these days. Uh, depending on and your uh, Windows security will not allow you to download it or install it. Hmm. <laughs> Handbrake has been working very well for me for that purpose, and yeah, it, it does pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have no objection to Handbrake. I just would recommend that those who can set up Linux, I uh, it works nicely under Linux. So you're saying Format Factory is now buggy? It's malicious. Kidoke. It will cause problems with your computer, and Windows Security won't even allow you to run it. You're saying that's the new version that's out there, right? Uh, it's been true for at least two years, okay. maybe four years. The older versions are not plagued by this, but it, uh, you have to find the old versions. And there are some issues with the old versions under Windows 10 and especially 11. Okay, so let's go back to topics here. Is there something else that somebody is interested in? Um, we talked about routers. We talked about safe mode. We talked about turning your uh, laptop into a home security system. I think that's kind of pushing it. It's more like a, a webcam. <laughs> Um, let's see how to update Google Play. The differences between a 5400 and a 7200 RPM. Anyone care? Speed. Speed. Yes. It is speed. Um, but the speed is only part of it. I mean, if you're, it's also temperature. So, if you the faster the hard drive spins the hotter it gets yeah. if you need a lot of data if you need a lot of storage and you need to access it fast then you go with a 7200 rpm but if you don't need speed and you still want a lot of storage go with a 5400 rpm in in nasa's in a server 5400 RPM is actually perfect. You don't need speed in a server. But the speed that's in there is just fine. You don't know. So, but you can put a 7200 RPM. It's just kind of wasting it because a lot of time it's just sitting there doing nothing but spinning, as it is in a lot of computers. 
Also, Sanford, if you're doing any uh, off the air video recording or any streaming that you are pushing through your hard drive, uh, it is recommended to use 7200 okay. RPM. And also to use a certain type of drive that records the data in a certain way. Yeah, there are two different types of hard drives. If you're doing like a, there's actually a surveillance hard drive, one that's designed for surveillance purposes. Yeah. Uh, that would be the advisable one. And I don't know how, what's different about it, but there, there are those that are out there. And I think they're capable of handling when you got 12 cameras coming in or six cameras and it's able to handle all that writing that's going on there. Yeah, there are some drives that are, I believe it's called shingled, and there are others that aren't. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's two different ways of recording data on a hard drive, two main ways. And one way is more useful for real-time recording and streaming. And right. the other way is more useful for data. So there are two different factors, speed and the way in which the data is recorded. Right, and it's part of what you, what's your purpose here? Ultimately, it's what is your purpose of what you're doing um, with that drive? I myself would just jump to an SSD in a laptop or even a desktop, but I would have a, uh, a, a spinning hard drive for my data and just load the data on there as your uh, secondary one. This way that gets hit more than the programs portion of the C drive, which is your boot portion. That's the most important. You want that to come up quick. You want Office to come up quick. You want your browser to come up quick. But the data associated with uh, the backgrounds can all be put onto a data drive, which should be a spinner. And also, if you're doing any recording, do not use an SSD. Generally correct. Yeah. The, you don't. You, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, but it's, it's not like a do not do and you're going to blow up your system. You can do it. Just, you know, you, you're going to shorten the life of the thing. Right. But not everybody cares about how long it is. If you're replacing your unit every five years, um, and I just pulled five years out of the air. If you're replacing it every five years, it doesn't matter if it's an SSD or not, because it'll last at least five years. Generally. So. Um, we lost somebody. So, next topic I had on my list. Why don't, we, why don't we revisit Power Toys? Uh, okay. Uh, Bill's got a question. Yeah, I was just going to say, if format factory is no good anymore, <clears throat> does anybody have any uh, alternates? I, we just said Handbrake is a good one, and I, Miro, M-I-R-R-O, is a good oh. one, and there are others. Okay. Just stay away from ones that are, I, that are constantly trumpeting that you can download from my various websites and do all kinds of other things to overcome DRM. Those are usually scamware. What was nice about uh, Format Factory is it was kind of an all-in-one. Yeah, you, right. you could convert your uh, music files from one format to another. You can convert your photos from one format to another. Right, right. You can convert your videos from one format to another. It is a nice all-in-one tool, and it did them relatively easy and quick. That was a, that was the nice thing about Format Factory. I do like it. Uh, I have an older copy of it, and I won't upgrade it just let it sit and whenever I need it, it's there. Might be good to try to find an old copy of it, an old version. I don't know when they became buggy. Any way to check to see how old my, my uh, copy is? Well, look at the date on there. Look at the version number okay. versus the current version number. Okay. It'll be older. Right. Yeah, um, older. And just don't upgrade it. Don't update it. Yeah. Uh, and, and I would say one thing you could do, if you could find where it resides on the hard drive, it may give you a date when it was created or a date modified. The date created is the, is the should give you an idea of the era that it's from. Modified might have when you installed it. 
So, but I'm not sure which one. If you did it in 2021, it might have that date on there. If I go to the uninstall uh, feature and look at it there, will it tell me anything? Hmm. I don't think it will tell you date. Okay. I think it would be the date modified because the date created is when they created it. Yeah. But Bill, if it's an old copy, just keep using it. Yeah, I think it is, but I'm not positive. Yeah, and just don't up like Bill is suggesting, just don't update it. There's nothing new you need. Yeah, I, I use 90 to do my updates and it's not included in there. Yeah, well, you know why it's not included? It's because of what they've become. I mean, you used to be able to get Format Factory through there. <laughs> All right, I'll do some checking. But if you can find it, if you can find alternatives that'll do some of these things, even if you have to have a couple or three applications, it's safer than uh, dealing with the current Format Factory. The I older versions, I'm not aware of any security issues, but you never know. I don't use it often, but it is nice. Oh yeah, very nice program. Okay, uh, the last thing we're gonna have time for is this, uh, someone someone asked us, asked if I would talk about the Power Toys changes. So let's pull up the update for Power Toys. And um, I, anyone, who, does, is there somebody in this group that uses Power Toys? I, I used to use it way back. Okay. I uh, uh, tried to install it on my 11 and I ran into problems and didn't have time to uh, figure out what the heck uh, uh, the issue was, but I could not get it to install correctly. So Power Toys, um has some little add-ons. It was originally created back, what, in XP or Windows? Yeah, 95 and XP is where they first came out with this stuff. And as I understood it, it was little bits of add-on software that engineers at Microsoft created that they wanted to put in Windows, but they were they it got axed. But they let them put these as little side tweaks that you could put in later on. And I, that's my understanding, as they were these little tweaks that you could do to your Windows Explorer. Um, and probably the, the best thing that I ever found was this image resizer right here. That I found very good to use, a very great tool. Again, this is photos related, where uh, somebody would tell me, okay, you took <coughs> these great pictures, can you email me you know, a, pic, a copy of that picture. Well, my pictures were, you know, big. They were like 10 megabytes each one. And that's a lot to send when a person just needed a small representation for something. So you could resize it to say, uh, you know, a 640 by 480 or a 720 by blah, blah, blah. And it would, with this was a right click on the tool, just a simple right click and it gave you the options to do right here. If you right click, if you could see this, can you guys see the screen where it says resize picture? Okay, yeah, so right click, in the old days it was right click. I'm not sure how the new one does this in Power Toys, but if you load this one in here, it lets you convert a photo, photo for, uh, to a smaller size, a medium size, a large. You can specify what you want to do. Um, <clears throat> You can uh, resize the original. In other words, not make a copy. If you check that, beware, be cautious on that one. Or you could just make it as a copy to a different size. And that was very, it was a real quick tool. I love that little tool. I used this all the time back in the days when I was limited on um, how uh, limited on the internet, internet connection or limited on my storage or what the person needed. If they needed a real small version of something, this was a great tool for getting this portion done. So that was um, image resizer. That's part of Power Toys. 
But said something there, go back one screen where you were. Sure. What's this download image resizer power clone? Power toy clone. Uh, download image resize power, power toy clone. I don't know why it says clone. It, let's see. Okay, so this takes you to, if I, this takes you to another associated site. I don't believe Power Toys is actually being uh, continually developed by Microsoft, and you don't get it from Microsoft itself. Can someone correct me on that? I think it's a GitHub uh, uh, location uh, where the current Power Toys are uh, uh, downloaded from. Okay, they're not. They're not coming from Microsoft. They're coming from GitHub. And so this would be where you would get this program go to file because i didn't want to download all the power toys but getting the imagery sizer alone would be okay yeah, uh that may be what you need to do you can just go go to file let's see move to here's the readme microsoft power Click toys So when I played with this once before, you had to download all the toys. Yeah. And I only wanted the image resizer. Right. Microsoft moved that one over to their app store. Image resizer from Windows 10. Okay. But that's not the Power Toys one. Oh. Now let's go over to where they are. Okay, I, uh, yeah, you've got a free download and you can get it at places like Softonic. And it's been updated July 20th, 2021. And for some reason it says Windows XP, that must be the minimum requirement. So how do I find this, Bob? Oh, it will not install correctly on any operating system after Windows XP. <laughs> oh. that's the, is that the one on Microsoft's side? No, that's the one at Softonic. Okay. That's the actual imagery sizer. Whereas the one that's in the store now, I that imagery sizer is the one recommended by Microsoft but I think it's a different program and it's ad supported. Okay, so the link that I was on was the link to the, the old versions of 95 for 95 and XP. So you have to stay on this page, which is uh, the link is in my um, uh, email that went out in the topics. And, that and there's... Yeah, and there's also a way to resize images in the Windows 10 Photos app. What was, nice, what was nice about Power Toys Image Resizer is you could you could use Explorer, highlight a whole bunch of pictures, right click, and say resize all these, and it boom, it would just go and do it. It was so quick and easy. Yeah. It was it, that was probably the best applicant. The application that they had, at least I think. Okay, is there anything else? In the in the, the power toys, there's another one that might come in handy right now, and that is you can the the renamer, the file renamer. Okay. Because what you've got now is you've got all these cameras that are putting out a rapid pile of numbers. And then the JPEG or whatever the file extension is, and you cannot tell what those are. So the whole renamer, I haven't tried it. You can actually do the whole, the whole folder and it will do, let's say you, let's say it was a, a family picture, a family picnic. You could say family picnic 2012 September and it would 
rename everything with an index number 010 through 99 or whatever. With a folder. You can do that right through File Explorer. What? You can do that right through File it's Explorer. Doing individually. You can't do the whole thing. No, as a group. Yeah. You just, you just highlight the group, then do a right click and rename. Okay. Yeah, I, I've done that. Uh, the the caveat of it is they'll say whatever that name is, and then beginning and end parentheses, and then it that in the number sequential number is in within parentheses. So it'll say family family pictures, whatever you want to say, family picnic, parentheses one, end parentheses, and uh, and that number is going to change all the way down. That's the that's the caveat on how it does it. And, yeah, but it works. But it works. It works very well. I've used it. I use it a lot for that purpose. Because again, when I'm out taking pictures, I, you know, you could sit down. I'll go someplace and take 300 pictures, and now I've got to name them all to whatever the topic is for the day, and not just the folder. Because once I get done, I start separating the pictures out of the folders, and they go to different locations based off of whatever their their main topic is. And that's just my sorting method. It says in the website there that the imagery sizer is available in Windows 10 and 11. Okay. When you, if you scroll down further in that page you were on the, for the power toys. Right. Further, so down, down, like... further down, there's a heading that says um, Download links of Power Tools for Windows 10, Windows 11. Right, um, right here. Download 10 and or 11, and there it and does you, require. Well, no. As you scroll down, it says here's some of the current available Power Toys. It does list the imagery sizer there, and it says here's a list of. Currently, the following power toys are installed by the installer in Windows 10 and Windows 11, and they list like oh, more than a dozen items there. Right. Okay. But as Bill was wanting to know, can you just down, download and install Image Resizer? And no, it's all that is part of Power Toys, the whole package. So you get this extra stuff that you don't need. Well, uh, uh, while you're on that page there right now, Fancy Zones is like a, a fences program for uh, uh, laying out uh, uh, in groups icons on the desktop and keeping them within boundaries. I remember that. I looked at yeah. that once and I prefer fences. And there's also File Explorer uh, preview pane extensions that uh, uh, allow you to see uh, 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 the content of uh, a general file and uh, uh, without having to actually open it. That's kind of a nice feature. So there's uh, uh, several there that might have real uh, uh, uses. Mouse utilities, I don't know what that is for sure, but it might give you features you currently don't have that you might like to have. <coughs> Further um, down, it says um, for Windows 10 and 11, you can enable, disable, customize these power toys. Looks like individually. You can turn on, off, desired higher power toy using the toggle buttons if you scroll down a little bit further in that so. okay well hopefully uh i don't remember if i actually loaded power toys in on my machine at all so i don't know i still if i put this on here can't answer that um someone could test this out and let us know how this goes for next meeting I might give it a shot again on that on my 11, but uh, the last time I tried it, I just, it wouldn't go in and it didn't make a whole lot of sense what it was trying to tell me as to why it wouldn't work. 
uh, and I just didn't have time to mess with it. And Bill, I'm with you about fences. I like fences. That's I, a, love fences. I love that. It's worth the 10 bucks to buy that product. Um, I think you could put it on multiple machines in your household too. I, is that correct? Anyone know that? I don't know. I paid for it twice for both my machines. Okay. Maybe that's the case. Maybe it's per I machine. But I will say it is, it's definitely worth it. I don't know if, if you have a lot of icons on your desktop and you want to organize them, fences is the way to go because it just does a beautifully beautiful job at it, at managing it, manage it, and you can, you know, gray them out, you can make them opac opaque. Uh, it's just a nice organizational thing. And it's one of the few things that I have purchased for my desktop other than, you know, like office or something like that. Any other comments? Something for possible discussion next next meeting. Yes. Uh, so I'm syncing quite a bit of folders from the desktop and from various folders. <coughs> and they're being synced to both OneDrive and to uh, my Apple Drive. OK. For, di for different reasons. The stuff that comes off the phone is off the Apple Drive. But I, I want to figure out how I could disconnect them from syncing. So and actually remove them to a spare to somewhere else. So that I save the space on the, especially on the Apple Photos or the Apple Drive with all its stuff. Because it's limited less than the my my uh, Microsoft drives, my one drives. All right, so this is so this is a problem, right? The problem is is you have okay, Pete. I'm trying to put this in words here, Pete. Pete has um, Apple. What do you call it? Apple Drive, Apple Photos. It's both Apple Photos and Apple Drive, and I keep getting a. A kick up saying that my my drive space on Apple is ru running out of space and they want me to read. Okay, well that's on their servers. So I should be able. I'm trying to figure out a way of taking the files off of their servers and keeping them just locally, <coughs> so that if I delete them on something, they don't get deleted permanently. Ah, uh, but that's. Same, Okay. That's the same case with OneDrive. Once they're synced to OneDrive or Google Drive, once you delete them on their drive, they're gone everywhere. So I want to do an offline backup of what I've got on the drives so that I can actually take take off stuff I'm not using on the drives all the time. The only thing that comes to mind, and I don't know if it'll work, uh, I've never tried it, would be uh, uh, third party syncing tools like uh, Sure Sync or something like that. You might be able to attach it to uh, uh, your uh, cloud drives and sync it to a NAS or a uh, uh, external uh, backup drive or something like that. I don't know the details. I don't know if it can even be done. Yeah, I'd like to see how to do that too. How to, how to sync them to my server. But I know what Pete wants to do is Pete wants to delete them from right. there. Once they're deleted, see, I, I don't. I know those services. Once you delete them, they want to delete it from everywhere. Yeah. Right. I want to get them off their services. You, right. To a local, to a local NAS or whatever else. Hey Pete. Yeah. Why don't you try just using a USB drive that has both a Lightning and a uh, and a standard USB uh, connector? You plug plug the Lightning end into the into your iPhone or iPad, it copies all the program, all the copies, all the photos to that, 
And then, so now you have it on a USB stick. And then you can delete it from the computer, from the phone. Yep. Which would delete it from the photo, from uh, Apple Drive, if you want to call it, Apple Photos. Photos or whatever the. Right, whatever they call it. And then once that, but what you have is stored lo already locally on that USB stick. Yep. So I remember we covered that before about having a USB stick. There are some out there as well as softwares that will suck everything off of your iPhone. And, and the one I have also copies your contacts. Right. Okay. If, you ever, if you ever tried to copy all the photos that are on your phone to a local computer, by doing Windows Explorer and drag and drop, good luck. It fails a lot. I don't know why it, they're, it's buggy. Uh, just the interface, it constantly loses connection and you don't know if you get all the photos and it's gonna take hours of work to try to copy them. I mean, literally, if you plug in your iPhone using a lightning and USB, plug it into your laptop, open it up, pull up the Explorer, because you can only explore in the DCIM folder, and you'll have all these subfolders in there. You drag and drop those onto your hard drive. It's gonna error out part of the way through, and then you have to restart the process again, and you have to, it's constant, and you, you won't get them all. I don't know, understand, I don't have an explanation. This has just been my experience. It sucks. it sucks. <laughs> Uh, by any chance, uh, uh, I've heard of uh, uh, non-Apple Lightning cables uh, that have lots of issues. So are your cables, when you do that, Apple's genuine cables or somebody else's? Yeah, yeah. I've done it with uh, Apple cables themselves. Okay. Um, and yeah, that was the problem I ran into. It's just my experience, that's all. It's, I think it's a compatibility issue or timing with Microsoft and Apple. They don't like, the, Apple doesn't like to play well on anything other than an Apple. So. <laughs> I will agree with that for sure. Okay, all right. Anything else? Otherwise I wanna end this meeting tonight. Oh, um, just a quick one. You're talking about Apple. Um... A few days ago, my wife got a new, my wife was notified that um, uh, from Verizon that uh, a 3G phone that she had would be no good by the end of the year. Correct. So they, so they offered some deals on getting replacement phones. One of the phones they offered was an Apple uh, SE. Phone. That's well, right. So she um, she bought it. She called, uh, did it over the phone, went and picked it up at the Verizon store, brought it home. Now, um, several days ago, our uh, our our Wow Internet um, went down. You know, it's rare, but it happened. So. She went and turned on the new Apple SE phone, and you know it had an introductory thing, hello. And then the first thing it wanted you to do was find and connect to your um, internet. To internet. Mm -hmm. And she was kind of shocked. I mean, she had an older phone, an eight plus or something, but she said she never ever had to do that before. But she couldn't literally, then she went and tried to research it. And she told me that what she looked up said that she couldn't actually complete getting the phone going until you link that phone to the internet. Did anybody ever hear of that? Or is that yes. legitimate? Most modern phones uh, work that way, uh, whether it's Android or uh, iPhone. Oh, how? How come they want you to go to the Because internet? they update your software on that phone via the internet. Via the internet. 
Not and they don't want to do it over sell because that uh, can cost a lot of customers uh, money in addition to what their regular fees are versus those that have unlimited data uh, capability and are willing to pay for that. My, my suggestion is to take both phones back to the store that you picked it up from and have them do it. Have them, right, have them do it, which they should have done originally. That's well, Dennis. well our, our internet came back and then it, it was no problem. But I, but I, but I guess it's been such a long time since we've gotten a new phone that she had never experienced that before. So, right. So, what about all the photos and contacts? Did that move over from the old phone to the new phone? No, because the old phone was a 3G phone. Doesn't it was matter. A flip, that doesn't it matter. Was, well, That's it was a flip phone. It didn't have photos or oh. anything on it. Okay. okay. It was an old flip phone that we just had, like as a backup phone. Uh, she didn't really use that flip phone. Yeah. All right, so she set it up as new. But what would have been what would have should have done is the store should have optioned or offered to transfer everything from the old phone to the new one. That would include your contacts information, any photos that were on that, would and programs would all move over. It doesn't matter about the three G. Um, but uh, the other thing that I would have suggested doing is I would have done it a, a tad different. Yes, they do require the internet, but I would do an iTunes backup locally and then do from the old phone and then do a restore using iTunes to the new phone. And that will move everything over automatically. That's just a technique to do. So, and as Pete had said, the other option would be if you get a new phone, you you take it to the store with the old phone and you let the people at the store do it because that's what they do. And that's what they're getting paid for, right? Absolutely. Right. Okay. I hope that they can do it because they couldn't done with my with mine. Okay. And that could very well be the case with Dennis's wife's phone. They probably couldn't do it either because it was an old flip and they may just say, no, just set it up as new. But in general... That would be uh, what I would suggest to do. Any other last questions for the evening? Nope. It's been a great meeting, guys. Uh, and we will end this and see you all next month.